Welcome everybody to the It Couple. This is our Halloween spectacular episode. Um, we have uh, one of my favorite people and comedians. This is a good buddy of mine, and we're covering like one of my favorite, like top ten favorite movies. Not even favorite horror movies. The Exorcist. And joining us today, handsome Joe DeRosa. Everybody, Mr. DeRosa, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm good. How are you? You're one of my favorite uh, people too. Do you yeah. refer to him as Handsome Dancing Jermaine? <laughs> no, he didn't. He wouldn't go that far. <laughs> but Joe, no. does, Joe doesn't age. Uh, that's very nice of you to say. I I, I feel like I'm looking my uh, years uh, these days. But uh, thank you, thank you. I don't age because I refuse to grow up. It's like a magic. I'm like a magic boy. (laughs) You're like the Rob Deidre. It's good to see both of you. Nice to see you, too. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I want to point out we're we're watching the original Exorcist because they've remade it, right? Well, no, they're doing they're doing kind of like a reimagining that's coming out. Oh, um, okay. With uh, well, I'll go fuck myself. (laughs) No, it's not right. It's not a reimagining. It's a sequel. It's a direct sequel. Oh, it is a direct it sequel. It is? With... Reagan's in it, right? I mean, not Reagan. Chris is in it. Isn't she in it, though? Yeah, Ellen. There's rumors. They're keeping it very quiet. Linda but... Blair's going to be in it. She will. Yeah. She said something in an interview sort of recently. When they're not in it, they go, yeah, it would have been nice if anybody called me. They right. get shitty. Yep. Yeah. When they go, uh, I'm not at liberty to say it. You're like, oh, you're in it. Cool. Yeah. You'll just have to watch. And it's like, <laughs> okay, we will. Because we know you're fucking in it. Yeah. And it'll be great. That movie's going to suck, by the way. That's you think cool. so? I think it looks pretty good in yeah. comparison. Really? I mean, I, mean is... I don't think it's going to be as good as this one. I don't think anything can be. But I think for a horror movie, well, it's David Gordon Green. Is that what you just told me, Chuck? Who I love. Well, like, he as a, the first Halloween was good. The next as a one's person, like, yeah. uh, he's amazing and, yeah. and just one of the nicest, kindest directors I've ever had a chance to work with. So I love him. Sarah, um, Sarah's uh, putting in her fucking I, resume right now. I would now. really love him to ask me to cast some of his <laughs> feature films. So I'm here, David. Well. You have my email. Um, no, he's great, and um, yeah. So I think it'll be good. And no, I, why do you think it's gonna be bad, Joe? I'm, I'm I'm on the fence. So I realize you just said every <laughs> once you said I worked with him. I was like, oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's the old. I always had that moment in a writer's room where you just start oh. shitting on somebody, and then all of a sudden it's like, actually, uh, we vacation every uh, October together and you're like oh but yeah. you know he's a great guy he's a great guy yeah yeah I think uh I don't well I I have a horror movie podcast and I speak very honestly about this stuff on it so I won't pull any punches I don't I, I also don't mean to be disparaging but I don't I like I think that David Gordon Green and Danny McBride do very good work in the comedy spectrum I do not think they do good horror work. I thought the Halloween trilogy was the worst three sequels that have ever been made for Halloween, which is saying a lot. You think it's worse than uh, Rob Zombie just, ones, huh? Well, those aren't sequels. Those are remakes. Yeah. Mm. Um, but but for as far as sequels go, I felt like they took elements that were already done before in other Halloween sequels and were done better and they had to do them differently because their thing had to be their own original thing. They couldn't rehash exactly what was already done. And all of the, I mean, if you want to get really nerdy, all of the criticisms about the Halloween sequels, everything that people said made how uh, uh, the average Halloween sequel, not great. Gratuitous violence, high body count for no real good reason. Um, you know, lack of investment in the characters. You don't care about who's getting killed, that sort of thing. They did all of that in the David Gordon Green sequels. And I just didn't quite understand why there was this big hurrah that we're going to do our return to form and we're going to give you the sequels that always should have existed. And we're, in fact, going to ignore even the good sequels in the Halloween franchise. And then they put something out that was every bit as exploitative and 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 over the top and gratuitous as any of those sequels ever were which is fine but it just sort of made me kind of question why that was the choice made maybe it wasn't their choice whatever by the third movie when they were talking about how they shot all those different endings and were testing all of them and and i get that that's part of the process but i was like 
this has lost its way. Like this isn't, I, this is just, there's way too many cooks at this point. I'm sure Jamie Lee Curtis had huge amounts of input at the, by the time they got to, to at least the third movie. And, and then, so with the exorcist sequel, three reasons I think it's going to be bad. Number one, I don't think he did a good job with the Halloween tr- movies. How dare Thank you? you. The villain really got me. Like at the end of the second one, I was done when they all beat him up and he was fine. That was terrible. They gave him a protege in the third movie. It was terrible. Yeah. It was fucking terrible. The happy ending with Jamie Lee Curtis yeah. was terrible. Like her not being his brother yet remaining in the town and preparing for 30 years for his return made no sense. It was just bad. It, it, everything they wanted to do in those three movies, H2O did it and H2O did it 20 fucking times better. I liked H2O. And, and H2O, I, and I, did, I did like the first one. Awesome. I think I I've like only seen it once. Did, but the yeah. next two, I, I agree with you for sure. But The first was the least uh, at- atrocious of the three. But I didn't like the first one either. But The Exorcist, there are three, reason, three reasons I think it's... I'm going to see it. I'm going to see it on mm-hmm. opening day because I'm a fucking idiot. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll be there with you, brother. The reasons <laughs> I think it'll be bad is it's David Gordon Green, number one. Sorry, David. If it was a comedy, I'd be excited. Number two, they use voice modulation in the first possession reveal, which is the cheapest, flimsiest. The whole reason The Exorcist, the the, the almost primary reason that The Exorcist is scary is the voice of Regan when she's possess- possessed. Mm-hmm. Yes. It is, it, is, it is absolutely horrifying. Mercedes McCambridge, right? Yes, and if you know the story of that, it's she was a classic, uh, respected actor, and she went off the wagon to do the part. She drank raw eggs and smoked cigarettes to get her voice the, to give it the timber. Oh, drinking whiskey. Yeah. This is a fun broad, guys. Yes. <laughs> this, this is, is called shame. method. This is called method acting, everyone. Yeah. Yes. And every one of the other possession movies I've ever seen, except for Exorcist Two and Exorcist Three. They do them. They do the voice modulation. They plug it into this effect that you can find in any run-of-the-mill uh, audio mixing program, and it just makes your voice sound. It's it's like a it's a like cheap. It's like it's like an effect that you can almost buy with a, a Halloween mask that has like the little voice box thing in it. It's a cheap fucking effect. It's corny. It's stupid. It's generic. It's not scary. And I always has always have said about possession movies. One of the reasons they're not scary anymore is that's the starting point. Stop the modulation effect. It always sucks. This has the modulation effect in it, which makes me think, now maybe it's only in part of it, Mm -hmm. but it's in the trailer, which makes me go, David, do do you know what you're doing with these movies? Because you keep saying you get it, but I don't know if you get it because that's not getting it. The third uh, reason I think it's going to suck is it appears to be that Ellen Burstyn is is doing the exorcism which is really <laughs> that dumb. Is weird and and uh and also i really hate I, and this is my biggest pet peeve i hate also legacy sequels they failed repeatedly with every legacy franchise they've tried to do it with minus a hand, small handful paul schrader did them some terrible of them. and he's he's one of my favorite screenwriters ever yeah it's really dumb. yeah it was it was terrible um but uh I hate in the trailer that she says every religion conducts exorcisms. We will need to borrow from them all. It's like, okay, guys, we get it. You're not alienating anybody. It's across the whole. This is what I mean. Like, like good horror doesn't come from that place. Good horror doesn't come from a place of let's make sure everybody feels great right now. Not I, I, I almost wouldn't even say wokeness, just going for a wide audience. Oh, if we don't make it just cathars, Catholicism, it'll be a wider audience. Right, you right. know what I mean? It won't because this movie was a wide audience. But yeah. like Serpent in the Rainbow is a movie about fucking voodoo. If they're like, it's not just voodoo, you could also make it about Kabbalah. You know, you would right. be like, this is what is yeah. this, what is this no, movie? But you're right. It's, I mean, I would think that the reason they chose to do that is so that they don't get any complaints. Right. Like, that's you exactly know, what are, they're doing. But it could not be. because they're trying to widen the audience, because I think a horror audience is a horror audience. Also, and the I think, Catholic Church has had a rough couple of years. Yeah, and so I think they. I think, like, that's another. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So like, not, it, uh, it's, it's, it's clear at the Church of Harvey Weinstein, high. you know, it would be like doing a movie about that, you know? Yeah. Also, 
Also, too, and the, this is the last nail in the coffin, and I will shut up. I'm sorry. We're cutting this all out because I want to work with David Gordon <laughs> Green again. Not. So continue you, on. You, I'm, just I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You said all you needed to say uh, <laughs> uh, to work with him again. I mean, the last nail in the coffin is Blumhouse. Blumhouse is terrible. They put out a terrible product. They get lucky once in a while but it's their with model, something though, right? like Whiplash. Yeah. See, They're I disagree terrible. there, too. They're terrible. Right. Jason Blum is obsessed with being woke. He's obsessed with being woke. He puts his agenda into everything. Everything is agenda first, story and everything else second. They make bad movies that make a lot of money. Like, And once you start doing that, you're Rob Schneider. You know? You're like... Well, I don't care if it's quality or not. I'll make a bad, you know, I'll, I'll, I mean, I don't, I don't understand why you have to shit on European gigolo, but that's fine. (laughs) The man is, the man's, I don't even try to shit on Rob. He's Newsmax's favorite comedian, Joe. Every time I see, I don't know who Newsmax is. It's like the more conservative Fox News. Oh, it is? Yeah. Oh, oh, he's on, Rob Schneider's on Fox all the time being like, I can't get away with saying anything. And then you see him live and he says, we can do it four times. He's like, I can't say what I really want to say. <laughs> and then he just does whatever Sandler gave him. <laughs> uh, but I'll just go, before we get into the plot, um, this movie is very important to me. I, w- I saw this movie when I was 14, and my sister had just gotten hit by a car, and she was in a coma for two weeks when I was reading this book. Oh, uh, and uh, and I was so into this. I did a report on it in my school where I ended up contacting Father James Labar, who was the head of exorcisms in the New York Archdiocese. And I sat him down and I talked to mm-hmm. him about exorcisms. And I had a lot of re- relationship. But the one thing that I will say, you know, and, and and you're right, it is one thing where it's like when you make it all religions, part of the, the thing about the book, because the book does this thing where it's, you know, it says it's an exorcism, but it's still makes it clear by the end of the book where it's like, it could have just been something supernatural. Like they don't, they don't talk because the whole thing about the book is Reagan. um, Reagan's mother, Chris is an atheist Mm -hmm. and she doesn't like religion and, you know, and she's going through a nasty divorce. So there is a Mm -hmm. debate within the book is, is this girl doing all of it? And, uh, and the only, and, and, and they need the Catholic church because, Without the Catholic Church, it then becomes really amorphous because you really have to have the uh, secular versus the religious. And when you just make it all religions, that like that takes that like kind of demarcation and blurs it a little bit, and it, it doesn't make the contrast I think sure. pop out no, as it's much. It's heaven and hell. It's the devil yeah, and well, God. You need and, it. Yeah, you yeah. You need that. The other thing is also uh, William Peter Blatty is the Exorcist, and William Friedman. Friedkin, excuse me, mm-hmm. secondly, secondarily is The Exorcist. Yeah, it's those two guys. Mm-hmm. Like, but it's really William Peter Blatty. William Peter Blatty wrote and directed, or, I'm sorry, wrote the book of The Exorcist and then wrote the screenplay. Friedkin directed the first one. It's excellent. Friedkin was supposed to direct Exorcist 3. Blatty and he had a falling out or something. Friedkin walked and Blatty directed it. The version that got shot originally was based very closely on the book legion the studios came in stuck their nose in it made him add an exorcism to the end of the movie all this stuff it's still a good movie but he was pissed years later uh scream factory finds i think it's scream factory found the original footage reassembled Blatty's original cut and released it as a bonus feature on the Exorcist 3 special edition. So my point is, is the man himself that created it has already given the middle finger to what people think is supposed to come after his original story. And he's made it very clear. This is the original story. Now I get it. It's Hollywood. It's a business. We all have to we sign things away and people have rights to do it or whatever. But countless people at this point, Exorcist 2, a studio on the release cut of Exorcist 3, Exorcist Dominion, uh, 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 Exorcist The Beginning, and now these new ones. It's like they all just move. F- there was the TV show. That the TV show was pretty in. good. The first season, I, I actually liked Not the bad. TV show. I was su- pleasantly surprised by the TV show. I don't remember there being. It's a Gina TV Davis, show. and she plays. I mean, the big. I don't want to give the big reveal, but there is a tie-in. I didn't think the TV show was bad either. First season, second season, didn't care. 
But yeah, I did think I, as I, far as the TV show goes or as sequels go, that was probably next to three, the best case scenario. Um, but my point is, is like it, it, p- people, person after person after person keeps coming along and trying to take what Blatty and Freed can put on screen uh, and successfully did so in two movies and recreate it or continue off of it or or would it, or expand on it and it never works it just no. doesn't work it's like exactly what's happening with star wars now people think they can take it and do their own thing with it they think they get it and it's like you don't get it clearly you get you get the highlights you don't get it and that's what upsets me is like that original movie and that original book i will only watch this movie every few years because it's one of the only horror movies that still scares me, and I don't want it to ever lose that. Like, it's such a special thing. It's such an intense experience, and it's 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 kind of sacred ground to me. Where it's like nothing, in my opinion, will ever come close to it. Nothing will ever be as good. The performances, the direction, the script, every part of it—it's excellent. It still disturbs me. Yeah. I mean, even the next best, the next best possession movie that I've seen, which is probably The Last Exorcism, which I thought was actually really good. I don't know if you mm-hmm. saw that one, Joe. It it's the found footage one, where uh, it's on a southern it estate, you know. And yeah, yeah, I went in with no expectations. It's the guy from um, Better Call Saul is the lead, um, and uh, I went in with which no expectations. The guy who's um, they're always like Saul is always uh, feuding with. He's like the good-looking okay. lawyer. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, mm-hmm. and he's really good in it, and it's it's just a whole different it's a whole different take on the genre. You know, they don't do the voice, and but the one thing they do that the book does, and the movie to some extent is it's all about is this real or is not this not real? Is this happening or is this not happening? Mm-hmm. That's the only thing that's kind of similar to The Exorcist. But The Exorcist, you know, it's it's not like a zombie franchise. Like, there's a million different things you can do with the zombie genre. I don't think there's a million things you can do with the exorcism genre. I really don't. Uh, no. Um, no, I, yeah, I don't think you'll ever, I don't think you could ever come close. I mean, look, half of these fucking exorcism movies are rated PG-13. It's like. Right. What was you know, this rated? Was This had to be rated R. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, definitely yeah, yeah. R. Yeah. It might have been. Was it X? Well, they had, they took out the crucifixion scene. And then no, then they didn't. They didn't. That that was the thing. Is the and it was it, the debate was the crucifixion scene. But um, no, no, it was uh, it was always R. I think they were thinking about NC seventeen because of the crucifixion masturbation mm-hmm. part, which is uh, okay. I read that scene on a beach. I oh, remember. Wow. And I was like, and then you got a boner. Uh, yeah, and I was <laughs> like, this little, is like, yeah. this is this is the opposite of <laughs> fucking Margaritaville. Um, but I'll just yeah. I'll just throw out, uh, yeah, directed by William uh, uh, Friedkin of the French Connection, who died about died very ago. recently this yeah. year. Um, Ellen Burstyn mm-hmm. as Chris McNeil, Max von Sydow, which I've been calling him Sydney Ow, so I realize that's wrong. His father Lancaster Marin, who was only forty four years old he when he shot age, this. My age, Joe. I'm forty four. <laughs> crazy. And it's my age. Best old makeup. You're doing great. Yeah, the Thanks. best, the best old person <laughs> makeup I've ever seen. Lee J. Cobb as Lieutenant w- William F. Kinderman. Uh, Kitty Wynn as Sharon Spencer. Jack McCorian as Burke Dennings. Jason Miller as. Uh, Father Karras, and originally Stacy Keach, they replaced Stacy Keach, who I think would have been very bad. And yeah. they were looking at, uh, they were actually looking at Nicholson, who I think would have been so wrong so for this. Wrong. And I love Jack Nicholson. Yeah, this isn't his movie to be in, though. He's fine in other. And things. what role? As uh, as William, as, as uh, the, Jason uh, Miller, as uh, as Karras. They're looking at. Okay. They're looking at Marlon Brando as uh, Father Marin, as the Max von. Oh, that would have been interesting. Sid now character, but but I mean. That's the other thing. Like that's the other thing too. Listen to that list of people you just read off. Now, now, nothing against the people that are in this new sequel, mm-hmm. but it's, I mean, they. I, I, I'm just speaking to the approach and reverence for the project. They brought in, in like, there's there's some true Hollywood royalty in that first movie. There's some real titans of the acting game. Yeah, I mean, Sid was all in the Bergman movies before this. Yeah, it's just, but it's not like they might be great, but like there's just a difference in approach. There's a difference in respect. You know, Exorcist Three stars George, stars George, George C. Scott. Yeah. It's like, and Brad there's Dorf. clearly a difference in reverence, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, who was unknown at the time? 
No, but do you feel like that's happening a lot because there's so many horror movies, which I love, being made that a lot of times these classics, it's really about like the talent that came out of it that also transcends. So if you watch certain movies, you're like, well, they went on to have an amazing career. Now, Linda Blair, people could argue, never really worked. Well, Friedkin had done the French Connection already. He had already won an Oscar. Right, I'm talking about like having the cast really can help make it a classic, I think, sometimes. I do, I think it, and that's not being like, oh, she likes to cast things. (laughs) It's not about that. It's just about how nowadays, I think that horror movies could be made, you know, for next to nothing. And then they're going to get actors who... Maybe they will come out of it. Well, I don't know. The Bloomhouse model is you pay for one guy and then everybody else is whoever. Right. Whereas um, like in the 80s, it was you could have talent to discover, but most of them were B actors and actresses, yeah. which I loved. You know, they're character actors. You know, look, there are the board of investors and their interests are very, very evident now in, in, in these films. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I don't even know if they were back then. It just seemed less noticeable or whatever. But... I mean, you you know, you watch a movie these days, there's 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 cards for six different production companies Mm -hmm. at the top of it. You know, all the actors, you know, after a certain uh, billing level, you know, get to have their input. It's there's just so many cooks in the in the kitchen anymore. I'm like, I don't know how it's possible to make a good movie, you know, like it's a fucking miracle. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're not wrong. But that's why I feel like everything now is like even a horror movie. You didn't have, you know, 1973 when this came out, there really wasn't any. I don't think there was cable yet, like true cables. You didn't. The only way you could see anything was going to a movie theater. And so it was a spectacle. Well, it was also the 70s was like an auteur uh, period for filmmaking, Mm -hmm. you know, like, I mean, kind of similar to how like some TV is now. And that seems to have been. Completely lost. But Warner Brothers releases December 26, 1973. I love that it was the day after Box Christmas. Box office, $12 million. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sorry. The, it cost $12 million. The box office was $428 million. Mm. Some random facts. Wow. Which, um, uh, just some random facts about the movie, which uh, real horror buffs are probably going to know most of this. But I got, I remember when it came out on VHS, I did this. I, I got the making of too. But Father uh, Farmingham uh, held a special blessing after... The set caught on fire. Everything but Reagan's room was destroyed. Which is crazy. It is kind of mm-hmm. crazy. But he wouldn't do an exorcism. Everybody on the like freaking's like, you gotta do an exorcism. And he goes, I'll do a blessing. <laughs> yeah. I'll do a blessing. I can't just do a fucking exorcism. <laughs> uh, <laughs> people sued it for subliminal messaging because people were like vomiting in the theater, and they're like, this can't. This can't just be a normal movie. Obviously, those are thrown mm-hmm. out. People were so crazy about this movie. The studio hired security for Land- Linda Blair for like six months after to, like, follow, her to around. follow her around. Jesus, uh, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, because people were so. That makes sense. As far as the deaths that are linked to this movie, um, you know, they bring up like uh, Lee Cobb, but he kind of like died like mm-hmm. a couple months later. I mean, it doesn't. It's not good. But Jack McGarn, the guy who played Burke, died of the flu. Uh, the father, Karis's mom, died. So that's kind of crazy. Um, and then a night okay. watchman, an electrician, like a bunch of family sure. members for the actors. Also, apparently the puke guy suffocated while masturbating. Yep. I'm just joking. <laughs> I made that one up. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't know if that, it, that seems like, I'm sure that you could find like Baby's Day Out has like 10 deaths linked to it. Of you know, like it does. Hollywood has like a, yeah. yes. it, it's a, what are those things? We're a very fragile group of individuals. And if you want to see it, actors, writers, so, you know, it was shot, like I said, by Owen Roisman, the famous shot, um, which we'll get to in the in the in the scene where the exorcist is outside, you know, Reagan's window. That is based on a Magritte painting, which is a beautiful painting. And you can kind of see uh, where it is, man. Um, This uh, got nominated one best (laughs) screenplay, but it lost to the sting, which Friedkin was really pissed off about for a feature or directing. Well, yeah, and he also, they wanted Pacino, I think, at one point for um, Father Karras, and he was so against that. He fucking hated Pacino. So. You have Brando is rumored to be in talks for Marin. Marin, England. yeah. Mm-hmm. He hated Pacino for whatever reason. Freaking hate Why him. did he hate Pacino? He just thought he was like an overactor, and, you know. But at this time, I was like, P- Pacino was great during this time. I don't know. I'm sure they tried to, like, go for the same chick. <laughs> I'm sure that that's, well, like, the real story behind the story. when did he fall story. off, do you think, Scent of a Woman? When was his last? I mean, he's when always he been in nutty? shit. But, like, Scent of the Woman is when he, like, I always say for Pacino, 
And Justice for All is a really interesting movie because the first half of Injustice for All, he's Godfather Pacino. Mm-hmm. And then by the end of it, mm-hmm. when he's doing the big speech of, you're out of order, <laughs> we're all out of order. He morphs into the Pacino we know today yeah. in that movie. It's like a werewolf. It's uh-huh. crazy. Because like he does all these scenes with... Um, <laughs> With the guy who was in Godfather 2, um, who played uh, Hyman Roth, who is this famous, he's a famous acting coach. Stan, not Stanislavski, but somebody else. Um, maybe it was Stanislavski. Uda Hagen? Not Uda Strasburg. Hagen. Strasburg, thank you. Like, he's in this movie, and all his scenes with him are very muted. Mm-hmm. And then at the area when he's in a courtroom, it's just like, like mad TV sketch, but he, you know, it's just like back to what we're, what we're watching now. But What role was he considered for? What? what role was he? He was a lawyer. He was uh, a lawyer. No, in this. Movie. Oh, Father Karras. They uh, uh, to be the okay. yeah. Thank you. Sorry. I think uh, that's that's interesting. Yeah, I just saw a thing about Serpico, where Serpico, the the real Serpico, was like, he, he was like, you know, I don't know, man. He's he overacts. That's not really how it all <laughs> went down. <laughs> um, it's a but lot. Pa- I love Pacino. I still think Pacino's a great actor. I think when he's in the right, you know, mm-hmm. the Irishman's a great example. When he's in the right he's movie, really it's great. That. Yeah. I thought he was getting Serpico too. It Serpico's funny though because the cops are so normal. Yeah. Like they're like, come on, man, just take the money. Yeah. <laughs> There's some, that's the one thing I love about Serpico is that like every single corrupt cop in cop land, they're always like, hey, I'm on the take. But all the cops in Serpico are really like, come on, bro, you're being a fucking bummer right now. Yeah. You're being a real fucking bummer. They're very grounded in their shame. Yeah, they're they're not like uh, Batman cops, you know. Oh. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Uh, look, I think uh, I think the 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 you know there's that series on Shutter called Cursed Films, uh, and it's about horror movies that had odd tragedies relate linked to them. Mm. Uh, and this this was one. Uh, uh, Poltergeist was one. Mm-hmm. Twilight's in the movie was one. Right. You know, and some of the tragedies. That was just are, John Landis are, being like, "Fuck you, we got this scene, baby. Yeah. Let's get in terrific. front of that helicopter, kids." <laughs> yeah, you know, like... he brought the whole jury out for fucking a meal afterwards. Uh, <laughs> it's so disturbing. They show the footage of it happening. Oh, I've, I've seen it. I've seen it. Thing. It's so brutal. It's anyway, I think yeah, I think it kind of becomes like the, the that movie, the number twenty three with Jim Carrey. It's like if you if you think it's everywhere, you're going to see it everywhere. Right. Mm-hmm. So you know. I, I think it, you're right. I think probably, you know, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids or whatever you could go, you know, you could make a series called Haunted Comedies and, and mm-hmm. find movies <laughs> that were yeah. about goofy shit that had six different tragedies related right. to each one. I mean, The really. Wizard of Oz is but, uh, pretty much, Yeah, you Wizard know, of Oz is way darker. Like yes, the darkest to... of like history that went on in that set. Yeah. I think that's actually, that might be one of the cursed films. That might be one of them. Mm-hmm. I think they go as far. It's it's Wizard of Oz is weird enough that it fits into the into the lineup of movies. Yeah. Or whatever. And now the Flash, but, um, guys, the Flash will be the next one. <laughs> is it the yeah, part where he holds a, a woman and her mom captive <laughs> yeah. in his farm the in Indian Vermont? Reservation in the Flash. Oh my yeah. god. Um, <laughs> the uh, have you guys seen The Exorcist two? I've not part seen two? it. No. Pur- purposely, everyone told me to go away from it. Is it's she Richard, in that? Is Linda Blair in Richard it? Burton, right? Her and Richard Burton. Oh, he's now the priest. Yeah, James Earl Jones. Again, uh, you know the approach, <laughs> the approach to star power is, is interesting, mm-hmm. but it's not a good movie. It's sort of like a fever dream. It's sort of bat shit. So I would say in a in a weird, um, in a weird like sort of nineteen seventies, doped up sort of psychedelic way it's it's an interesting movie at Mm -hmm. at times but no it's it's by no stretch a good movie that said it does have i think some genuinely scary moments in it and it is certainly more interesting than the two prequels they made that that you know paul schrader's and then they recut it Mm -hmm. with uh i forget i forget what director recut it and reshots i mean those are just Mm -hmm. holy god they're they're just unbearable paul schrader's hilarious man because he has it and then he loses it, and then he gets it again. Like first reformed was amazing. I don't know. If first I saw reformed that movie. was great. Well, yeah, my friend, my, well, my friend, my Pat Walsh, my friend, and the guy I do my horror movie podcast with, we were talking about the Paul Schrader Exorcist on there, and he, <laughs> Pat goes, and it's so true. Pat goes, Paul Schrader was going, the true horror is a man's loss of faith. Oh, like, God. Yeah. I, all right, Paul. Sure. Come on. Like, Christ. Let's go. Do a fucking horror movie. Uh, but um, they uh, 
The, that movie has a they, they, those both of those the the original and the recut have like all these weird like CGI coyotes in them and uh, it's just bad. Uh, I will say, uh, the girl, the little girl in this new one coming out looks mm-hmm. scary. Yeah, she does on look the scary. posters and stuff. And the new, new trailer just came out. I'm gonna watch the new trailer when we're done here, and maybe the new trailer looks better than the first. Well, the trailer. big the big scene in this one is that I like, guess she shits and has her period in the middle of a church service or something like that. Like they had to like it's it they they Wait, make is fun that of it. Yeah, she comes like in the middle like it, it's just a cut, but they she comes in the middle she crouches something happens. They literally do the same thing on Black Mirror. I was just, just gonna now. say that was on Black Mirror when <laughs> yeah. she shits in the church. Yeah, I'm not I'm not <laughs> sure. It's the same writer. Yeah, I mean, I kind of, when I saw her walk in the church, I was like, I feel like this is just going to be a play on when Reagan walks into the party and pisses on the floor. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they did a really good thing in the series where she masturbates with a curling iron. Ow. That's actually the only way Sarah can get off. (laughs) So. Yeah, mine would be turned on. It's turned on. Oh, yeah, mine too. (laughs) With the squiggles That's around the it way. for the yeah. girl. I think she's going to have some lukewarm crawling out of this. This girl's been around Piping a time or two. hot you know? in the puss, Joe. <laughs> Just in case you're wondering. She wants yeah. to sterilize that shit. Yeah. Um, but we open. Uh, it was one of my favorite openings ever. Uh, they're in a rock. Oh, yeah. Uh, Father Marin is on an archaeological dig. Mm-hmm. He is. Uh, mm-hmm. He's a. He's very confused because he finds, you know, a token, a little. Um, Little uh, little token, I guess you could say, little amulet of the demon Pazuzu, who is the demon throughout this movie. And they don't hit you over the head with it, which I like a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, through this, through hit the clock stopping, um, through almost getting run over by a horse-drawn carriage, he starts to realize that, fuck, I'm going to have to go against this demon again, which we found out that he was almost killed in an exorcism in Africa. I'm not mm-hmm. sure if that was the same demon, but... I think it is. I think it is, it is the yeah. same demon. And the very end, the it's such a beautiful shot. It's uh, Father Marin, you know, going to this last dig site, finding the statue of Pazuzu, stare like him staring it down back and forth uh, as the sun sets, and two dogs fight in the background, and then we have in red lettering, the Exorcist. Two questions: How great is this opening, Joe? And have you ever had a moment as a comedian? Right where you find the demon Pazuzu thing before a bad weekend. Like, have you ever seen that where it's like you go into the green room and you see like, <laughs> Oh fuck. They really liked, uh, they really liked, uh, Chris Kattan here. You see the words, the improv. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you see it and you're just, and you start like shaking and taking your heart medicine. Cause you're like, this is going to be a rough fucking weekend. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, I have. Yes. I, I've many times have, have, have sat outside shows or venues and been like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't know how I can do this. It's one of the reasons I stopped doing full. It's one of the reasons I stopped doing weekends and started doing one night, one night shows. Uh, I was like, if I'm going to keep doing this, I got to tour like a band yeah. does. Mm. But we then get kind of all the Georgetown stuff all out of the way. We go to this movie. It's it's beautifully shot. So beautiful. And George. It's like in the so fall. Funny. What? Dan circling back to the movie. <laughs> so anyway, this is, uh, uh, I know, and I have to pee well, uh, so bad. Go right pee. Now. I can do I'm this. Sorry, I can Joe, do the I'm going to leave you for a second. That's um, okay. Can, the, the whole first of the part of the movie, we see Reagan is in D.C. with uh, her mom, Chris, who's the movie star. They're filming a new movie about um, the '60s and the anti-war movement, which is really interesting because, you know, in a lot of ways, this movie is. Hey, the '60s doesn't work. Like peace, love, and happiness doesn't work on everything, guys. You know, and it's that like, kind of mm-hmm. like that conflict. Um, but you have like, yeah. which is interesting. You have like the two main characters, Chris and Father Karras. You have Father Karras. Sorry, Father Karras. He's watching the film she's in. Chris walks in, uh, walks past him doing his work, where he's like trying to get a, a disillusioned priest excited about the priesthood again. Meanwhile, and this this time, this is why the movie really hit me. You know, my mom passed away in February, and we had to institutionalize her. And there's a lot of guilt that comes around when when you have to go through right. that. And it's still, you know, it still is is with me. And those were the most haunting scenes for me is when he goes to, you know, her shitty neighborhood and she's in an unsafe place. And then, 
you know, eventually she takes a, I'm kind of bouncing around the movie here, but she takes a turn for the worse and ends up in a mental institution, which she blames her son. Yes. This is a very, these are all very real, horrible things that you have to deal with when your parents get older, guys. Um, yes. And, and they're horrifying, but they're not horrifying in a spooky way. It's just a very, it's like him trying to find God around all these hopeless, hopeless mil- milieus, if you will. Um, meanwhile, um, we're kind of seeing where Reagan and Chris are at. Chris uh, is going through this horrible divorce. <clears throat> the brilliance of the film is it does take the horror of actual life and it butts it right up against super true supernatural horror. Both of them are hideous and frightening and terrifying. And then the icing on the cake or the best part, the, 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 the glue, the, the thread, whatever you want to call it, that really marries all this together so beautifully is everything that the person is horrified about all of these internal things you do. Like these are the things that eat it. These are the things the the, the personal struggles in this movie, these are the things that you go through the day and don't think about. And when your head hits the pillow, the demons, you know, no pun intended, come out and start to taunt you about all this and you can't sleep. These are the things when you wake up at 4 a.m. and you have the stomach ache and everything. I can't believe I put my mother in that place and I didn't have a choice, but oh my God, and what have I done? I'm the worst person on earth, right? And they take all of this stuff that these uh, characters are struggling with and then they have the demon voice it to them. You know, this is another thing that people don't get with possession movies. They think it's scary to have a demon go, your mom's down in the hell and she's taking a shit in the devil's mouth and he sucks her pussy. And and it's like, no, that's, it's not scary. It's horrifying when a guy is already guilt ridden about his mother. You have shown us this. You have shown us literally the nightmares he has about his mother walking on the streets of New York. And then this fucking demon goes, your mother sucks cocks in hell. Like, like she's dead and you killed her and she's in the worst place possible. They do a really funny version of it in semi pro the Will Ferrell movie. When he keeps talking about his mom and the, the coach of the games is Matt Walsh, but he's a priest. And uh, and he's like, and he says, Matt Walsh says something like he ejects Jackie as the character from the game. And he's like, get out of here, Jackie. And he says something. He goes, he goes, go cry to your mom. And he's like, or go go write a letter to your mom or something. And, and Will Ferrell goes, you'll have to write it to heaven because <laughs> she's dead. <laughs> And then the priest goes, maybe your mom's not in heaven, Jackie. <laughs> and it's such like a 12-year-old, it's like a thing a 12-year-old would say. Yeah. And it's so immature and so funny. And and like Will Ferrell starts crying and then the whole team forfeits the game. <laughs> and it's very funny. But like at its core, it's the same thing. It's like they do a really good job of setting up this guy's connection to his, his dead mother mm-hmm. and like why that has left him a, a wreck. And they do it in The Exorcist. You see it. You you invest a lot of fucking time with them. It's like in Dust Till Dawn, man. You're so invested in Harvey Keitel and his family. By the time they get to that place and they the people turn into vampires, that you're just like Jesus Christ. Like please let them get out of this alive. Yeah. I love them. They're trying to they're trying to start a new life. And it's the same thing with this. Like. It's fucking trash. And they do it with all the characters. They don't, you know, that's the other thing. Usually in a movie like this, you might get to spend that time with um, the mom and the daughter. Maybe. Uh, And in this, they're like, no, you're going to you're going to spend it with everybody. You're going to see Marin in his life. And we're just going to hint at it, but you're going to see why this is so heavy for him. We're going to spend a lot of time with Father Karras. You're going to get to know the police chief. Yeah, that you know, uh, you know, and and why what his investment is in this. And then when you see him at the end, and he sees that Karras is dead, it would like you, you you. There's weight in that. There's emotional stake in that. Mm-hmm. Like, 
everybody, everybody plays such a weighty role in this, and you get so much backstory. In the book, you get even more. I mean, you learn about that guy that the director, the butler that the director keeps calling a Nazi. Yeah, his his daughter, his mm-hmm. relationship with his daughter. And and all of the, like, you know, like, the reason that it's there, all this stuff is there, is to give you an idea. Like, they, they find, we find Reagan, like, looking at the ma- the gossip magazine, talking about her parents' divorce. Mm-hmm. You know, we, 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 he's basically giving you slivers of doubt. Like, is this a possession or is this not a possession? This is a movie about faith. So we're not just going to see someone purely corrupted we're gonna see an actual real person and you're gonna have to you know it goes back to that the devil mixes lies with the truth what's real what's Mm -hmm. not real in this movie um but this movie is so good guys that it was able to make us uh fact forget about the uh (laughs) catholic church child sex ring operation that was going (laughs) on like this movie was so good it was like like i get was that happening then too it was happening all the time but it it wasn't out like it wasn't out it was not a big story in like the boston but i I, it is kind of funny like this was like the best pr movie for the catholic church like ever. well because Especially he's the hero the yeah, i mean religion is the hero here and that's i i grew up catholic joe i don't know about you but i went to catholic school which is kind of a joke did, you know catholic school yeah so you kind of know about the fire and brimstone of it all and you understand like good and evil but good was only what the bible quote unquote said was yeah. good and everything else was bad and then when i met jewish kids and they're like well, we don't believe in a hell and i'm like where does the devil live like you know what i mean like where the fuck does he go and like having that catholic guilt all the time of like every time something yeah. bad happened like when the challenger blew up my sister said i did it because i st- lied and stayed home from school that day and i believed it Jesus. so like is there a thing that yeah. i could have been possessed by the devil yeah, and i brought down an entire spacecraft yeah. i don't know but <laughs> it is it's kind of that like weird study it is it's well, the good and evil that's it it's bad and good it's a it's it's a beautiful uh thing that they that it's a great tool that they use in this movie. Catholic guilt plays a huge role in this movie. Uh, uh, Islamophobia and xenophobia plays a huge role in the movie because the demon comes from uh, uh, the I, Middle I forget East. The Arab, it's the yeah, Middle I East. Which yeah, country well, they make in. a yeah, point. But, they make a point of being like, "Well, this is a Christian relic in uh, BC times." So, oh, I didn't know. Yeah, that. they make a point of saying like, "This is." Uh, this isn't from the same time period. Like it's 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 more of that. Like it, it's less Islamophobia. It's more that he found Father Marin there. Like Father Marin tried to get away from him. Got it. And, and he found and, him and they there. found this relic well, that shouldn't be there. You know. I took a class on the movie. I went to like a filmmaking camp when I was yeah. in high school mm-hmm. for a week, and we took a class on this. And uh, he the. The teacher taught showed us that the reason the movie opens with Islamic chanting is because Islamophobia was so prevalent in the, in, in the culture at the time. Mm. And he was like, that's a great move. It just immediately offset this audience that was already freaked out about this religion they didn't understand. Yeah. There's all kinds of sound mix stuff in the movie. Dogs barking and fighting that you can that it, it's mixed way low, but it's in scenes that weren't where there aren't dogs. There's bees buzzing mixed in there's a lot of uh there's a lot of like one or two frame imagery that that flashes that you don't see um they do a lot of that it's really really well done but but um the 70s i don't mean to keep picking on this new movie it could be good and i'm not trying to i'm not trying to single we're just talking about this movie so Mm. it's it's a good example but I'm, i'm really not trying to just pick on this one thing it might be great i don't know um but I have reservations, but anyway. Um, and you're going to go is, see though, it, so you'll decide. They're still going to get your money. It. He's so getting my money. They either don't way. give a shit either way. <laughs> <laughs> they don't care. Yeah. Uh, well, I'd like to be on the Righteous Gemstones one day. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> a nice, uh, uh, heavily recurring role, guest star. Come on. Folks, there, I would, yeah. I would love to be uh, on but, the in the Exorcist sequel. So yeah. uh, whatever, whatever. Dan would like to yeah, want, you like you would like to be an extra in the background. <laughs> like you don't even need lines, hanging out. So, but, but one thing I will say, and I think I could say this with some certainty, and this is a problem it, am, amidst, oh, sorry, amongst uh, all modern film, they will not allow that sort of thing to happen anymore. They will not allow you to take an element and insert it into a movie 
for no better reason than it is going to off put your audience in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because the studios and everybody else sees that as a statement on that thing. And that's not what they were right. doing. That's not what William Freakin was doing. He wasn't making a statement on it. He was making a statement on the fear of the public. And we want to get them into a paranoid mindset as soon as this movie begins. Mm -hmm. And Elements like that, I mean, you'll you can still see them, but they're going to be in independent films. And then, if that film does well, then the, they'll pull that guy or, or or woman out of making good movies and force them to direct Ant Man fucking six, <laughs> and that'll be the end of that. But uh, but you know, um, it's a shame. It's a shame. Like like, it's it's it, it's it's fascinating to me when you see a horror movie with mainstream appeal and release that is actually still good. Um, because this the horror genre to me is like comedy, like stand up comedy. It, it's like, it was, it was like the sort of last frontier to me in filmmaking where you could kind of get away with anything because mm. it wasn't award worthy. So nobody gave a well, fuck. Well, Henry Zabrowski brought that up on our podcast. He's like the worst thing that happened to horror is it going mainstream. He's like, yeah. we, we do not need, we do not need Marvel, the Marvel universe of horror. Mm -hmm. you know? No, and as and as happy as I am for Jordan Peele, and his success, especially in an industry that needs diverse voices in mm -hmm. in in the way that that Hollywood and film industry does. That that inched it a lot. That brought Chris. Now this movie was at least nominated. I don't know if it won or not. It won, it no, one best Oscar, it won best writer. Screenplay. Freakin' was furious that he okay. didn't win best. But he didn't win best director, right? He should have won. Feature. This is a better movie than The Sting. The Sting's a great movie, but this is a better movie than mm -hmm. The Sting. He should have won. I will say that. But did when this... What I swear to God, picture? when... Oh, God. What? Oh, what won the Sting best won picture? best picture. Oh, best picture. Yeah, yeah. I don't... I don't first, I don't. wouldn't see the Academy giving... An Academy Award yeah, to a religion, just, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. there's the devil involved, and they didn't yeah. they didn't go all the way. But Screenplay I mean, it was sense. it was the first horror movie that's like it was really in contention. I mean, not until Get Out did they think that uh, they were in contention. But and what's what's get us up to? Well, the, my take, real quick, real quick, my take. W w when Jordan won, I was like, "That's great. That's awesome for him." I hope it helps move black filmmaking forward. Please leave horror alone after this, though. Yeah. I was like, please don't let this elevate horror also to a place. Where, and it's it is, mm -hmm. though. It's happening. Look at all the shit A24 does. You know, A24, I believe, sold or was up for sale for five billion dollars. Wow. Damn. Like this is because it made hits. Yeah. And it's like, mm -hmm. You're like, I don't want this for horror. I just think it's fucking well, bad. I agree with Henry. People want to people want to yeah. bet on the future. Um, let's just get to um, where things get really spooky. Um, just some, some background. There have been noises that are going on in in uh, Reagan and Chris's townhouse. Um, you know, Chris thinks it's rats. It's not rats. She thinks she it's rats in checks. the attic. Well, no, she tells the handy guy to go. Yeah, she says Carl yeah. goes up there to mm -hmm. check out whether or not there's rats. Uh, there are no rats. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Reagan is starting to draw, you know, creepy stuff, which they, they do link in the book. They link all the sacrilegious things that are happening uh, at Georgetown and the churches in the community to Reagan. So, like, in the book, you find out that she was the one, um, you know, causing all these desecrations. One of the desecrations uh, is the Virgin Mary with a big red dildo uh, strapped on her, which I believe will be Ian Fidance's yeah. final form. Um <laughs> <laughs> but um uh you know it's basically it's building up essentially it's building up to sh she's a little fatigued she's not feeling well but it's building up to this big party scene mm. that chris is having uh we start off again to sow to sow the seeds of doubt of what is really happening carl gets in a fight um with uh burke uh where burke accuses him of being a nazi it's kind of hilarious, man, because they mm -hmm. try to like fight uh, in in the uh, in the party. He gets thrown out, um, but it's like a rap party. So yeah, it's, it's like a, a bunch of theater party. kids yeah, fighting they're, 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 over well, like it's, it's, it's a rap party, and there's also it's it's like a high society party because there's an astronaut there who's about yeah. to go to space. Um, we also find out that Karis's mom is dead because one of Karis's good 
Priest Friends is there, which is great. They do some interweaving of this where yeah. you don't have to have the whole fucking scene where Karis finds out she's dead because that's not mm-hmm. an important scene. You know she's old. You know she's going to die. You don't right. need that scene. And you know he left her. So right. So there you go. And at the very end of the party, they're all singing show tunes or singing whatever. Mm-hmm. And this is when... This is awesome. This is like... This is the mic drop. It's my favorite moment in the book. And it may be my favorite moment in the movie, but she comes down... She turns to the astronaut and she says, you're going to die up there mm-hmm. and starts peeing immediately. Mm-hmm. And, and boom. like staring straight. Yeah. Like now we are, we are in a horror stare. movie, folks. Yep. There's yep. no fucking doubt anymore. Um, yeah, because up until that point, it's just sort of like little. It's just little, well, ominous, spooky. Yeah, you're like, okay, so it's, something's coming, but I'm not really sure what. And then that's yeah, the moment yeah, you Dildo realize. Virgin Mary is kind of hilarious depending on. Yeah, you know, I mean, who amongst is. us hasn't put a dildo i mean i defaced an entire wedding album of prince charles and lady die and i wrote dick over mother what, teresa's what head do this? What do you t- as Val, i own the second book well My you didn't do it to their me. theirs i thought you were ed Megan markle's wedding no <laughs> i didn't do That's it to the so actual no to the book that my mom had but i was like four writing like dick across mother Teresa's head that's a living fucking saint you know like i was fine though i wasn't possessed i gotta go this was, <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what's happening. This was so, so disturbing for here. me because then we go into the part where like chris does everything under the sun uh psychiatrically to try to like you know kind of clear her uh her daughter reagan and at the time my sister was like in and out of coma and freaking out so there was like a lot of really similar things going on in my life while this happened um, you know, the doctors think it's a problem with the frontal lobe. Meanwhile, Father Karras is mourning the death of his mother. So you have two kind of stories of, you know, two, two, uh, our two lead characters, you know, Chris and Father Karras are in their own hells, mm-hmm. even though they're very, uh, they're very different. Um, and, uh, eventually okay. Chris starts to feel, Hey man, this is like, this is something else when the bed starts to vibrate and she right. gets up there mm-hmm. and she's, and you know, the kid, you know, the, the, the bed is vibrating. She's starting to, you know, Mercedes voice is starting to come out. Mm-hmm. Um, right. I do think Carl could have been a Nazi by how calm he is during <laughs> these <laughs> moments. Like he's the only one in this movie, Carl, who's co- very calm during mm-hmm. the possession Throughout scene. all of it. He's yeah. like, yes, I, I strapped him down. Who, who mm-hmm. you know what happens? Um, and, uh, yeah, we get to the point where Reagan's kind of done everything. I mean, Chris has done everything she can do. They hire a, they 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 hire a, a fucking hypnotist at some point. We also find out that Burke has died. Um, mm-hmm. We hint that Burke was, uh, you know, we, we say that Burke was watching over Reagan. And then when she when when uh, Chris gets back home, the apartment door is open. Right. You know, um, Burke is gone. We find out that Burke has fallen to his death mm-hmm. from the, the assistant the director. Mm-hmm. And now in the director's cut, which I don't mm-hmm. know why they didn't leave this in, it's the famous spider walk scene. Reagan comes down the stairs. Yeah. Backwards. Backwards mm-hmm. as a spider. Shout out Bray Wyatt. Rest in peace. Um, mm-hmm. And it was, uh, I mean, man, dude, this is like, I, I watched Why do you scene. think they cut that out? They said they cut it out because it was too scary. Joe, do you know why they cut that scene out specifically? Was it because it was too scary? No, but it is really scary. Mm-hmm. It's so fucking no, scary. No, I don't know why they cut it, but I agree that it's very scary. They should have left it in. But yeah. I mean, I do see like structure wise, like that's the hypnotist scene, it follows that. And it's mm-hmm. basically, it does the same things theme wise where it's like, okay, none of the, none of the new medicine is going to work. Um, we got to go, you know, old middle ages. She ends up approaching Karis, yeah. uh, sa- says to him, Hey, we need to, uh, are you able to perform an exorcism? Now he's, he's really head of all like the, me- the mental health of Georgetown. So he's against this. He's like, we really should take a fucking, mm-hmm. you know, we should take a time machine to the 15th century if we're doing this. But again, like, you know, you have him kind of no selling the exorcism. Um, but he goes and sees, uh, he sees he sees Reagan and he's uh, pretty disturbed by the fact that Reagan, you know, knows about his mother's death. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's enough where he comes back and gets recording equipment and uses water he thinks is holy 
Uh, oh, she thinks is holy. So she gets freaked out. He starts throwing holy water on her. Right. She starts saying it burns, it burns. Turns out it's not holy water. This again goes back to the the devil mixes lies with the truth. Is she really possessed? Right. Is she not possessed? Is something else going on? But the thing that finally makes him, okay, we've got to do this exorcism, is he gets a call uh, from Reagan's assistant. And they make more of a not deal. Not Reagan's assistant. Reagan's, yeah, assistant. Her, no, I'm the sorry, mom's. Chris's assistant. Mm-hmm. The mom's assistant. Um, and they make more of a deal about this in the book because the assistant kind of is very religious in the book. So her and Chris are kind of going back and forth. But they, um, he finally agrees to do it um, when, he, uh, when he gets into the bed and he sees Help Me, uh, which Reagan mm-hmm. is presumably writing uh, inside her own body yeah. because she has completely lost autonomy and the devil Pazuzu has taken over. Also, uh, we, we forgot it. It, it. There's also a, a scene where she masturbates with the crucifix. <laughs> I, I skimmed over that one, uh, which is like, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's the most gnarly scene in the fucking universe. But, um, yeah. Which scene for you, Joe, is the one that you're like, Jesus fucking Christ. Well, that, they, in, yeah, that one's the worst. Yeah. That, that one's the worst. Absolutely. <laughs> The help me always. That's the one thing in the movie I'm not crazy about. It is kind of scary, but I'm, it's it's the one you know. I guess it's weird to say implausible part because the premise is already pretty crazy. But I don't know. Given the rules of the movie, uh, which I do think it does follow rules and it sticks to them pretty well, it's always kind of bothered me. Like, how is she writing that? from the inside of her body. Yeah, Why? I always thought Wait, it was on what? the outside. Like, how did they see it? You know what I mean? I always thought it was just... Yeah. It is kind of funny. It does become a comedy if you just think... No, I... You cut to... No, you cut to her inside the body be like, <laughs> help, get me out of here! <laughs> Hello? No, uh, we watched it... We watched it recently. Yeah. Like, I've seen it a million times, but, mm-hmm. like, watched it recently for this. And I was... I had had a little edible, which I don't really have yeah. a lot of, and I thought it was the funniest fucking movie in the world. And I'm like, see, this is the problem with a lot of my friends. They see one horror movie. They think, it's that's it. I hate horror movies. It scared the shit out of me. I remember seeing this when I was little. It scared the shit out of me. But when you're high and you watch so many horror movies, you're like, oh, it's kind of, her yeah, voice is kind of funny. She ruined the ambiance like, for me. Because last week, I'm like, <laughs> getting back into that place again, and then I just so hear sorry. my fucking wife losing it. Cackling. cackling. About, like, but, uh, her little head spinning. But and, I, I will say, after talking to Father James, James Labar, that New York archdiocese, mm-hmm. he would, the one things he would say is that he saw somebody with something written on him. And In the uh, inside? Yeah, like something similar to that. And mm-hmm. that, you know, they all know different oh, languages. Okay. That's something. But again, it's like he showed me a video of his, and I'm like, this woman's clearly mentally ill. This woman's right. not possessed. But that's right. what they say also, like, right. was Reagan yeah. really possessed? Was some of it, you I've, know? I was like, like, I've done open mics with this girl. Like, <laughs> she's, she's fine. <laughs> Um, you fucked her too. You <laughs> fucked her too, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we set up essentially for right. the movie's climax. Um, and uh, as soon as it, it, it is crazy because the exorcist part of the movie is only like 15 minutes, the real exorcist. Yeah, it's true. I mean, you almost forget how long it takes to yes. get there because yeah. it's where it starts, how it sort of slowly goes in. It's building the backstories on the three adults, really. And Reagan, you see her as a happy, normal child. Okay, mm-hmm. dad's out of the picture, whatever forgot her yeah. birthday but yeah. like then it just it's just it, it starts slow and then it progresses very quickly yeah and M- mac yeah. shows up and he looks man this is like some of the best makeup i've ever seen because mm. he does not look 44 well, he no looks he doesn't 50, even look 54 not, here yeah looks great i don't think it's a ton of makeup though he kind of just looked old his whole life that's what i was wondering like he's in hannah and her hannah and her sisters is what years the, well i guess that probably is probably a couple years later no that was Hen and her sisters was in the Late 80s. Late 70s or 80s? No, like early 80s, mid 80s. But he's 80s, like an old 86? man, you're right. Hen and her sisters. 86. He's an Do old man in Hen and her sisters. He's like, don't leave what me. Year I'm was old. This, movie? this was 73. What, movie? what year was this? This was 73. Okay, so. Hen and her sisters was 13 years later, 86. Okay, so he's 57 in that movie. And but he, he certainly still looks, looks older. Old. But yeah. Yeah, it's still, but it, but it's, it's, it's enough of a gap, but. But yeah, I mean the makeup, whatever makeup they did do in this, it is very good. Yes. No. I mean, on, on across the board, like all the Reagan makeup is is ex, is amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. It's, it's, it, there's it's not incredible. one. Even the head spin around is even though you could tell the head spin around is fake, it's still freaky. No, it's still freaky because like, no one had ever done something like that. And then like the pea yeah. soup and all of that. I mean, it's just. 
it's been, you know, well, they, parodied in so many different ways. But when you watch the original, and I'm, again, sorry, I was I, high the other night and I was giggling. <laughs> but if I watch it sober. What did I maybe? say about getting high before a <laughs> podcast research? Guys, I don't get high. I just had a little to take off the edge. Uh, yeah, but it, it, it's, it's brilliant. All of it is just uh, it's brilliant. Our final, yeah, the pea soup, I mean, the vomiting, one of the reasons the vomit's so great is it's hot pea soup, and Friedkin kept everything on the set, like, below 30 degrees, so everything <gasps> is, like, this, the vomit is, like, this steamy Ugh, fucking... So it looked that way, because it was really cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, But they start, they make some headway, you know, they start, you know, uh, reciting the ancient uh, exorcism prayers. Mm-hmm. You know, that we get all the great shit that you've seen, you know, like this is I, I feel like I've seen this last part of the movie a million times. Like it's always on TV and I'll always have to watch the end of it. But, uh, you know, Reagan, you know, lifting off, uh, lifting off the bed. Mm-hmm. We see the demon Pazuzu, her getting out of her straps. She makes like some of the same body movements as Pazuzu. Uh, she really gets into um, Father Carrick's head because when they come back for the second part of the exorcism, mm-hmm. that's when she really turns on the mom why you do this to me, Damien? Mm-hmm. Why you do this to me, Damien? Yeah. Which is awesome, man. Because That's like so good with her. You know, the like actors like voice, that yeah. whole scene. She's the mom. Like, there's not a moment mm-hmm. where she's like the death scene. So they realize, like, oh, right. that's the money shot of horror. Um, Father Marin tells him to leave, but it's in a very like paternal. Mm-hmm. It's not. It's not like a high school basketball coach. He's like, please, I understand. He knows it's dangerous. This for is him very to be bad. There. Please mm-hmm. leave. Um, he goes downstairs. You know, I mean, really, it's a roller coaster at the end of this movie because Chris is like, is it working? Is she going to survive? Mm-hmm. He hears something. He goes up. Father Marin has had a heart attack. Reagan is now out of her straps. At that point, uh, Father Karras, we haven't even mentioned he was a former boxer. He just throws her on the ground and starts fucking deading her in the head. <laughs> just like her. punching yeah. the shit out of her. Uh, and he finally says, to me, to me, he rips his, he rips his frock. He rips his mm-hmm. collar off. She, uh, she, the devil Pazuzu then leaves her body, goes into Father Karras, mm-hmm. who goes to choke her, and then famously goes no, <laughs> and and jumps yeah. out the window, falling down the stairs, breaking his neck. You know, the cop shows up, everybody's around. There's this beautiful mm-hmm. moment where you know his friend, uh, who's the father, is administering last last rites. At the bottom, which which kind of annoyed me because then they bring him back and and in the sequels, I'm like, well, that kind of destroys like the really nice moment mm-hmm. they had. Um, and our last scene is, uh, you know, Reagan leaving the house and Chris. They finally found a new place, and she doesn't remember anything that happens. But then this is where it becomes the Catholic Church's biggest. Every time they bring up a molestation story, they should just have this meme of her hugging the priest when she says the collar because it's like the cat the very end of the movie the catholic church can do no wrong mm-hmm. she hugs him i know that he's great um and yeah man just a classic fucking movie dude i, I can't think of a better horror awesome. movie than this yeah you know I it's mean- awesome and then yeah in that final moment karis sacrifices himself you know it, it's 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 his it's his redemption and his penance for everything he's felt guilty about in uh, throughout this story. In the book, it gets far deeper into his you know his crisis of faith and all that mm-hmm. stuff. But uh, you know, it's it's an amazing ending. And then Legion's amazing because Legion, the sequel, is is uh, picks up with uh, um, uh, the detectives. I forget the name of the detective, yeah, detective, but it, it centers on that. Yeah, it centers on him, and he goes into an inst. Uh, there, there are these mur- inexplicable murders happening in Georgetown, and he goes to a hospital to investigate uh, and look at one of the corpses, and he sees Father Karras in one of the padded cells in the uh, mm. in you know in the in the insane asylum part of the hospital, whatever it's called, and he doesn't understand how it's possible. He just knows what he saw and. It kind of goes from there, and it's a pretty, pretty awesome story, um, and deepens the relationship between, between Karis and what's his name, Kinderman. Sorry, yeah, Detective forgetting. Kinderman. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, well, in the it's book, just they're awesome. far closer. It's... Like they're friends in the book. Like they, they they like see movies together and shit. Yeah, that's that's big in Legion, and but it, that's it's funny because in Exorcist they don't really explore that as much in the movie of The Exorcist, and then in the sequel in the exorcist three 
he, Kinderman says a lot, like he was my best friend and all this stuff. So when you first see it without knowing the what the book details, you're kind of like, wait, what? Hmm. You know, yeah, it is a little weird. Friends. It is confusing. But, I mean, it, it is confusing because there's all these mythologies. Do you think any horror movie comes close to it? Like, where is your top five? You put this number one top five? Yeah, number one. No, scary wise, no. My second favorite horror movie and also my top ten favorite movies is Creep Show. Love Creep Show. But for yeah. entirely yeah, for entirely different reasons. Uh um, you know, the fly with Gold Bloom is probably in my top three five. Cronenberg's um, great. We were just watching scanners. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, and the fly's really scary, but for very different reasons. Mm -hmm. the, the idea of deteriorating away like that is horrifying. But as far as something, you know, I always say the best horror is the best horror premises are, are things where you can't escape. And this is a great example of that. It's her daughter. They're in their home. She's upstairs. It's like, where are you going to go? You have to stay you have to see this through nightmare on elm street another top five like for me it's like where are you gonna go you got to go to sleep eventually so you better figure this out you know the fly he's he's turning into something he doesn't understand okay it's happening by the minute almost i have to figure this out so I think that's the best my 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 number five would probably be texas chainsaw massacre and same thing. It's like we're we're stranded. We're in this town. We don't know anybody. We don't know where we are. And the people that we thought we could trust are actually secretly working against us. Like there's your you you got it. Like there's your premise. Now it's like, okay, these people are fucked. Now what do you do? So I think the exorcist uh from from a less um literal uh, sense of being trapped like Nightmare on Elm Street where you know you have to go to bed eventually you can't avoid it but more an emotional uh, uh, trapping of like it's my daughter I can't leave her you know and it's happening to this mother at a time where she's saying I'm not spending enough time with her and I'm too focused on my career and like you know in some of the other later what was it if she it's, had just listened to Jordan Peterson you know, and <laughs> this whole thing could have yeah, been avoided. Exactly. I would love to see Jordan Peterson that is just telling Reagan, clean your room, clean your room, get that thing out of your pussy and clean your room. <laughs> oh, I think actually it's weird. I think it's an exorcist too. I think Reagan actually says in that, like, you know, she doesn't really talk to her mom anymore because, you know, my mom was more interested in her career than she was me. And then in the TV show, the mom writes the book and everything. And uh, the, uh, spoiler alert, but the Reagan character in that says, I think the same thing about like how she doesn't really want anything to do with her mom. Like her mom's always been sort of exploitative and, and somebody who climbs toward the spotlight and everything. And it's interesting. It's interesting. It's it's there in that first movie. It's just not it doesn't hit you over the head. The show they use the world of politics like the movie uses the world of Hollywood where it's like this fake thing and this real, you know, this real horror happening in this fake world. But I would give the look, man, as far as what I've seen, I, you know, the movie is the classic. Watch the movie, read the book. Mm -hmm. Everything else is secondary. But if like you're really looking for an exorcist fix i think the first season of the show is pretty good and i think there's stuff that you can like from the third movie you know nothing in the second i haven't seen the second but oh, joe right. says i love the third i think the third one even both both cuts even of the third one i think is awesome i love it i mean we'll check that um, out on our patreon oh for sure you should well folks joe, thank but you anyway so much. thanks for having me Wait, yeah dude joe plug, thanks, yeah, plug thanks stuff, for having me talk, yeah, talk yeah. About i hope i didn't stuff. talk too much no, no you didn't. no no, I, no. I, I, it's, it's weird I, I get that when we're doing the plot sometimes but taste buds podcast with sal volcano and joey rose's uh sandwich shop one of the best sandwich shops oh, so good in new york thanks, city buddy. check it out it's really good yeah and your horror podcast yeah we'll, we'll see you in hell uh, Patrick Walsh and myself reviewing movies every week. We review genre movies, mainly horror, but we drift into other stuff sometimes. But uh, back catalogs out there somewhere, wherever you get your podcasts. But the new stuff is all on Patreon, patreon.com slash WSYIH podcast. 
Um, and then tour, please come see me live. I'm touring all over the place. Uh, I got dates coming up. When's this come out? It's going to come out around Halloween. So where are you in November? If it's not the 28th yet, we're at uh, Arlene's Grocery Saturday, the 28th, mm -hmm. with uh, my band Salsa Windfall. Please come out for that. Uh, but then stand-up shows. Abin no, that's past. That's past. Philadelphia, Theater mm -hmm. of the Living Arts. That's the big one. November 11th, Hell Theater yeah. of the Living Arts in Philadelphia. Please come out for that. Pittsburgh, PA, Bottle Rocket Social Hall, November 17th. Buffalo, New York, Theater at Seneca One, November 18th. Denver, Colorado on the 30th at the Summit. Crescent Ballroom in Phoenix, December 1st. And Soundwell in Salt Lake City, December 3rd. I hope to see you out there. Please come see me. Thank you. Fun stuff. Guys. Thanks for having yeah, me. Joe's one of the best. So check out. Thanks, stand Joe. Up. This was so great. Uh, and you yeah, two, geez. honestly, like the. You guys are great. The way you both love this movie, though, it's it's so like pleasant well, to be I around. Mean, and part of the reason I married you is you reminded me of elements of this movie. And I'm for sure fucking Reagan. <laughs> the only like, way I can. No way. Yeah. We're, yeah. All right. Well, we're gonna do some stuff with the crucifix. Until then, <laughs> folks. Have a have a see good you guys. Stay spooky, America. Bye. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. And if you liked what you saw, like and subscribe on YouTube and join our Patreon, The It Couple.